Hello, beautiful people. Welcome to the Occult Explorers. I'm Snappy, and I'm joined by my co-host and good friend, Dion. How's it going, Dion? Good afternoon, people. <laughs> good to see you. So this is going to be a fun one. This is exciting. We're back for the fourth part of our deep dive into entheogenic husbandry. This time, we're going to be focusing on the bovine, cows and bulls. And for People, if they're not aware, the cow, like what you were finding in your research is basically the cow is kind of like the most important, right, of all of the of the husbanded animals and the most ubiquitous across the globe, right? Well, there's a lot more mythology concerning the cow. Um, also, we're going to have heavy trigger warnings. We want to remind you the second half of the show, we have the doctor coming on, Amon Hillman. Um with this trigger warning because we talk about animals sexuality sacrifice um even politics racism it comes up in these these mythologies and folklore so just to let you all know right. we're not racist towards anybody in any way any shape or form no we love all peoples and we just want to present to you these ideas from the sources as we found them you know and again we want to remind people we're not experts we're here to show you narratives and to talk about real beliefs real ideas and real things that are happening you know and as much of an unbiased way as possible you know so we're just depicting stories and if these stories are nationalistic or racist or vile it's because they are that way and uh, we think it's important that we address these things as they are and you know the cow is such a a powerful symbol, a symbol of royalty, a symbol of sexuality, a symbol of sacrifice. This is going to get wild. It's going to get dark, and it's going to it's going to feature some abuse. So, trigger warnings, please. You know, uh, take all of this as it is. You know, and prepare yourself and understand that we're not here to pass judgment. We're just here to to present the stories and the narratives as we have found them. Right, Dion? Oh, sounds good to me. All this right. ain't the first pick. Okay, so we're going to go fast quick. today. we got to go fast. Yes. Running of the bulls. You know, I remember this growing up in Spain. You know, this, uh, the symbology behind this, it's so deep. And then bullfighting. Um, you this know, is like super, super ancient too, because all of this kind of stuff, like you see um, similar festivals like in ancient Mycenae and in like ancient Africa, right? Oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, I like the colors they're wearing red and white. Right. But, you know, you would say that this would have deeper roots in European culture, um, Etruscan, Greek, um, Scythian, Russian, got all the different older cultures there. Slavic, um, there in France is some of the oldest uh, paintings, cave paintings of cows in the world at Lascaux. Um, I think they're twenty thousand something years old. That's amazing. On wow. the wall there, I, I didn't put a picture of it because you know we could only put so many pictures today. But uh, you know, even in uh, Nordic mythology, there's a bull or a, a cow uh, called a, a Dumbla. A dumbla, and she licks uh, these rocks to produce salt, and that's how they. Uh, she gives birth to Odin. You've heard the myths of Odin, and Buri, and Odin. So the Norwegian gods are uh, tied with bulls and cows, and people will say that comes back to some older Germanic stuff. That there really is a presence for some old cattle worship in Europe, going way back. Amazing. You know. So we're going to talk today, we're going to break it down into sections. We have the Greek, we're going to go to India, we're going to get into Zoroaster, Persian, Islamic, Mithra, and get into Egypt, and then into uh, Canaanite. So let's hit the first pick. Boom, right there. So uh, you have Isle, you know, the goddess, uh, she has horns, cow horns in some of the representations. And here she is being um, received by Isis with the snake on her wrist in Canopus, because we talked about the Canopus star in the past too, in Egypt, because they're connected, Isis and Io. 
you know, um, Zeus was uh, fell in love with her. Why? Because Zeus and a lot of the myths rapes people, turns into animals. It's very famous. Um, gets with her, and then he has to hide hide her from Hera. Of course, you know, and so he turns her into a into a cow. Hera gets mad and sends a gadfly to sting her endlessly. And we've talked about the gadfly in previous episodes as being um, a psychoactive type of a fly and symbolic with psychoactives. And so the gadfly stings her until she wanders into the Black Sea area. And that's the Bosphorus, Bosphorus, you know, wow. uh, where we talked about Aphrodite up there before, Aphrodite Odinia. And Bosphorus means ox crossing. Oh, that's interesting. I did not know that. Yeah, wow. I don't know that either. And it's dealing with that, you know, um, hit the next pick. So here's another uh, bull. And this deals with Zeus again. Zeus wanted to kidnap Europa. Right. You know, and part of the trick was he produced uh, a saffron crocus from his mouth. And so I picked, I got that pick because of the saffron crocus color in the robe. And you know, saffron crocus is, is used in psychoactive formulas. Right. And we know like the saffron and the crocus are central to a lot of these cultures, like going all the way back to the Mycenaean, right? They There's depictions of them growing the saffron and with saffron colored robes, you know, and there's some speculation that they were using the saffron as an entheogen. And we know for certain that later cultures are definitely doing that. So, oh, wow. yeah. And, you know, there's more to the story. People say that this is from an older myth dealing with the Starte. Um. Europa was uh, a queen of Tyre, a Phoenician queen of Tyre, and she gave birth to Minos. You know, you've heard, you've heard of Minos, which we'll talk right. about next, you know, who, and she uh, marries Asterios. And that's why the Astarte, that, that Astar root, you know, and if you know about the story with King Minos, um, hit the next pick. Boom. So I know I'm going to butcher the name, but it's uh, Pisfe, Pasifae. That's the wife of Minos who falls in love with a, a bull. So Daedalus makes a cow suit for her and she gets in the cow suit and has sex with the bull. Wow. The representation cool. of it right there. And um, she, she gives birth. And who does she give birth to? Let's hit the next pick. The Minotaur. Asterion. Yeah. And it's that I'm talking about that Astar root that deals with Zeus and these bulls. And we know that that Astar root, right? It has that STR, which is always connected to the, as Ammon will always talk about, and we'll have to pick his brain later, is it's connected to the cannabis, you know? And, and you this know also, drawing down the stars. Oh, and yeah. Like you said, Astarte, Venus, Aphrodite. You know, in, in other myths, um, Europa is uh, kidnapped because of Io is kidnapped from Argos. So Io's in the story a lot. You'll notice this popping up. So here you got that Minotaur. And if you know the myth of the Minotaur, it, uh, there's a labyrinth and, it ch and you have to give up sacrifices and it chases around people in that little uh, labyrinth there. And there's a relationship on Crete to cattle that goes way back. Right. And this also gets into one of my favorite stories too, right? The myth of Ariadne and Theseus and them having to solve that whole thing, which is a, such a wild story. And it's, it's also kind of depressing because in the earliest versions of the myth with Ariadne, she's not even connected to Theseus. You know, she's, she is on this island with Dionysus as her lover, but in the later tellings with Theseus, right, the whole story is that they send these sacrifices to the king Minos, who get fed into the labyrinth to go face Asterion. And Theseus decides that he's going to become one of the sacrifices. And he goes to slay the bull. But Theseus can't just slay the bull on his own. He needs the help of Ariadne. And it's very similar to stories we see with Medea and with Circe, with Helen, you know, um, this idea that the woman by the curse of Aphrodite falls for this man and then does everything in her power to help the man achieve his victory. 
And famously, what ends up happening to poor Ariadne is that Theseus abandons her on this island. You know, um, there's a bunch of different versions. In some versions, she uh, she cheats on Theseus with Dionysus, and other ones, uh, Theseus kills her. But eventually, what ends up happening though, she gets abandoned on this island by herself alone, and Theseus runs off with her sister. <laughs> mm. So depressing, <laughs> you know. Mm. You know, so this is the next figure. Boom. You know, I remember as a, as a little kid, I used to have these books and it would show some of the art there on the island and they would do these uh, bull jumping. They're on the frescoes there. It's very famous. Uh, and you can see they're very androgynous looking uh, beings there. Right. You know, and they, and they play around with the bulls, jump around with them. It's a whole game. And it's funny because I was a, as a kid, I told you my father was a butcher and we lived in the slaughterhouse. And then I had these little books with the cows and played the cow jumping games. You know, so I had an introduction to cattle early, you know, because cows are special in terms of food production, milk, protein, leather. You know, um, the cow patties or cow dung as a fuel source. You know, we'll get we'll get more into it today. So. Uh, you know, some of the myths, Odysseus, there's something called the cattle of the sun. Yeah, Helios' cattle. Oh, you know right. about that one? Yeah, where they steal the cattle. And, yeah. And he tells them not to mess with the cattle. And of course, they go mess with the cattle. It's it's ridiculous because the story is, is right, Odysseus goes to the island of Circe. And one of the few things she tells him besides like avoid the sirens is don't fuck with the bulls of Helios. And of course he goes and he's like, but these are the best bulls. They're the best bulls for the best sacrifice. So he steals some and he wants to sacrifice into the gods. But then, of course, Helios has to punish him, right? And he gets cursed. Oh. <laughs> and they destroy the ship, right? They destroy the, uh, the, the Argo gets destroyed. <laughs> and you know who's another uh, cattle thief? Hermes. Right, right. But guess what? what how do you say cattle thief in, in ancient Greek? I'm not sure. Cyclops. Oh, wow. That's what I looked it up. <laughs> I never I knew that. Talking about that. It, it, it looked it up, and a cyclops is related to a cattle thief. That's so interesting. It makes sense, because we know that the cyclops are related to the, or, or an actual group of people, and it may have to do with some of the drugs that they're using. And, uh, you know, they're treasure hunters. It's like, there's all this weird stuff we'll have to unpack with Ammon. Um, oh, before yeah. we move on from this, from the wrestling here, I also want to point out that we see similar motifs in Harappa, you know, which is in Pakistan along the Indus Valley River, you know? So this kind of is very prominent imagery in the early Bronze Age, you know? Oh yeah, so let's hit the next pick. Since you're talking about wrestling, some wrestling right here. Um, right. Jason. Oh, oh, Jason, yes. A white bull and a black bull with mm. bronze hoofs, spit and fire. And what gives him the power to uh, wrestle and tame these bulls? Medea gives him a, a body rub, a lotion that he rubs on his body made from special herbs. Amazing. Oh, you know, wow. in this myth, and what, the, the term for them are what the, the calcutori. You know, these bulls. The fire breathing bulls with the bronze hoofs, which is a theme that goes way back. You will see it in a lot of different cultures, you know, um, and in these Greek myths, the relationship with the with the bull or the cow. Um, in a previous episode, we talked about the Eleusian mysteries at Eleusis. Um, and I asked the AI if the cows there, if they had a uh, ergot rye. If they would produce LSA, and I said yes. Oh, you know, um, it's part of their digestive tract because they work with grains, breaking them down. So they break down that the air got in the wheat, and their milk produces has LSA in it, which we know they were using dairy in the Kaikion. That's amazing, you know. And in the other episode, we also talked about the goats. And, and them using goats and goat milk in the Dionysian rituals and psychoactive herbs being passed through the goats as well. That's true. You know, and so uh, with that, I want to hit the next pick. 
And you know, in India, we know that this is a big thing too. The 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 making of um, certain drinks that have a milk base, a cow milk base, like bong, which is um, cow's milk infused with cannabis. You know, oh. and sometimes other other drugs like opioids or um, sometimes even mushrooms. You know, so. Oh yeah. So here is Dionysus Tauros. Oh, I love that. Not with the goat horns, but with the cow horns. That's or so with the bull horns. Yeah, because you know, normally he's with the he's like a more of a goat figure. So. Yeah, this is when he's a uh, uh, Taurus as a bull form of Dionysus. You know, um, talking about India, let's hit the next pick. Boom, Shiva. So this comes from Harappa. This is one of the oldest Harappan seals. Now it's highly contested that this is Shiva, but. If you look at a lot of the iconography, there's a clear, in my mind, connection between um, this figure and what becomes Shiva, you know? So often scholars will refer to this as the proto-Shiva. We have the, the triple face, okay? We have the yogic position, right? We have the um, arms that look somewhat vegetal, and we have the horns. So a lot of scholars actually connect this to a specific version of Shiva that is worshipped in the, in the northern regions called Pashupati, or Lord of the Beasts. And if you notice here too, you have all of these cow sigils kind of around. And this is a very common thing in all of these sigils, are these because what these are are seals, they're wax seals. And it's very, very common in the Harappan society. We'll see often bulls, but you often see this thing they call the unicorn, which is looks more like a form of cattle than we would think a, a unicorn today, but it's clearly like a magical cattle like being. Mm. Yeah, and this is very old. Lord yeah. of the Beast. It, and people talk about the connections of Dionysus going to India. Right. Dionysus Tauros. Just say. Um, now the connection between Shiva and the cow. Uh Shiva Nandi. I didn't put a picture, but in some uh iconography she was riding a bull almost always he's riding a bull or at least um Nandi, Nandi's a very interesting figure because if you go back to the earliest of the uh Shaivite text Nandi is a man who's born out of the cow sacrifice out of the yajna and he's known as the keeper of the doorways and he's always associated with guarding the threshold into the temple and with protecting of Shiva but what ends up happening is you know, uh, as this iconography develops, it becomes related to the bull because the bull is seen as the most loyal, the most devout. And then all of the these figures have to have a mount. So they kind of become conflated where Shiva's mount and Nandi wind up becoming the same figure. And a lot of modern temples, before you go in, you will see Nandi facing the Murti as kind of outside of the doorway. He's guarding the entrance, but he's also in this act of worship and praise, you know? And then there's these famous myths where like Shiva comes into town with his entourage of all of these uh, radical spirits, the Ganas, and uh, he's always riding on Nandi the bull, you know? Mm. These mythologies go deep because, you know, the cow is sacred in India, but cows used to be sacrificed in India in very complex Vedantic rituals. Yes. Just say a, a switch happens, which you you uh, posit, and a lot of people posit, is Ashoka. Yeah. So uh, basically what we see is um, if you go back to the earliest Vedic texts, right, uh, the cow is even more prominent than when we see in, in, in Harappa, but it's not like a god figure it's it's connected to the yajna sacrifice and it's connected to this goddess figure aditi which is very similar to nix it's like the cosmic the entirety of the cosmos and the whole idea of aditi is she maintains rita the cosmic order the unflow the flowing of time and how everything is meant to be and also the sacrifice is a part of this cosmic order there's a belief that if you do not perform the sacrifice, the cosmic order is it maintained. And a lot of people make a big deal of the horse sacrifice, and that is kind of like the main central rite. But the average yajna does not involve the horse, it involves the cow. And what's really interesting in the Vedas, there's actually eating of the cow flesh too, right? They're sacrificing the cow, they're eating the flesh, they're drinking the milk. But what you see is this kind of um, transformation. And you brought up Ashoka. I think 
it really starts with the rise of Jainism and Buddhism and, and these, these competing ideologies that practice sort of ahimsa. You do see elements of ahimsa in a lot of, of Hindu texts, but it's not to the level that we get with the Buddhists and the Jains. And then by the time Ashoka comes around, he bans these sacrifices. He finds them barbaric. And while he allows people to practice Hinduism, no more sacrifice. And so there's kind of this uh, belief at around this time of this real specialness of, of nonviolence and of the priestly castes having to become vegetarian and maintaining this strict kind of purity. And this is where the cow sort of takes on this even, it was always sacred, but it becomes even more sacred in this period. You know, it becomes even more protected. And then that even gets more intense by the time you get to Gandhi, who kind of reinvigorates the cow as sort of this political Hindu symbol, you know, and as this pure being of peace. And it, and since uh, the time of Gandhi, you know, the, the cow is synonymous now with, with Hindu thought. And I'm not, it's always been there, but it's even more prominent than it was in the ancient past. Mm. You know, let's hit the next pick. Come oh, wow. Am I saying it correctly? Yeah, Kadenu. Yeah. And it's, there you get Shiva again. Um, touching his throat, his blue throat, which has that mushroom symbology. There's the snakes there. Because snakes are always in a lot of the images where you're going to find cows as well. Um, I don't know if you see down below where she is... Uh, She's oh, pouring her milk over yeah. the uh, the sacred lingam, right? Yeah. And the lingam we know is the is the merging, right, of the male and the female, right? The pet, the base is this vulva, and then coming out is this phallus, you know. And in some of the original ones are the most powerful ones. That's a meteorite um, lingam, as well. Um, she has a peacock tail, um, wings. And so there's a lot to these mythologies. We'll start to unpack. You'll see more of them later so on. But, oh, yeah. And so um, you were talking about the, the yajna, the Agni Hotra yajna. The, um, it's like a burning, a fire of herbs. It's a purification ritual. Let's hit the next pick. Boom. One of the central elements is these cow patties or cow dung. Um, and there's more to the cow patties because they, they got a program in India. If you could turn in cow patties and they pay you for it, it's like a fuel source. And keep that in mind. Cow patties is a fuel source as a sacred yeah. fryer. When I was in India, you would uh, in the rural areas, you would often see people, you know, collecting the patties and drying them on the sides of buildings or on the sides of hills to make these fuel sources that they, they would then sell in the village or use themselves, you know. And this is the predominant way that pe many people are still heating their homes. And like you said, it's essential to the sacrifice. So all these temples are using it, you know. The cow is, is a pure being of love. So even their excrement is seen as somewhat pure, you know? Mm. Well, you know, um, <clears throat> they would use camphor as an igniter and to mask the smell, and they would mix different herbs. You'll see there's herbs that they mix in, and they've done different um, tests recently, like what's it, gas chromatography and mass uh, spectro uh, spectrometry. Oh, and with these herbs, and they found that there's germicidal properties using oh, these different wow. herbs. Yeah, you, some people say, well, it's cow dung. Well, with the addition of certain herbs and burning it, it's giving off germicidal properties. Purification wow. rituals, the sacred fire with the cow and the properties in the cow dung and the properties in the, the milk and the urine as well. You know, there's another term, it's a pancha gabya. Yeah, the five, I'm trying to remember, oh God. The five, five. cow derivative, yeah. It's fermented yeah. dung, urine, milk, ghee, and curd. Amazing. Mixed together and, and it's used in, in ceremonies as a healing potion. <clears throat> Mind you again, I'm going to repeat that. That's the dung, the urine, the milk, ghee and curd fermented together to produce a healing potion that can have lots of different properties. And we're talking about bong. And so this is also using the soma rituals. You know, people, we've talked about soma in the past, different uh, milk based um drink that's fermented like a kaikion a milk bin based drink that's fermented with herbs in it it could be ephedra 
all there's kinds tons of, of cannabis. Tons of speculation about what exactly is in the soma. In my personal opinion, it seems that cannabis is most certainly in the soma. Um, I know Carl Ruck likes to, to claim it's the mushroom. I'm I'm hesitant about the mushroom just because we have these brahmical, brahmanical um, injunctions against the mushroom. But it, it's certain that they're doing all kinds of different things. And we know like the ephedra, they're doing in the uh, Homa, which is coming from Persia. And the way that they describe some of the effects of the Soma, especially in regards to Indra becoming this, this super powerful warrior figure, uh, it very well could have contained ephedra. And we also can't deny the fact that probably this drink is something that evolved and changed and adapted over time. And as these Aryan peoples are moving across the Indian Peninsula, they're adapting to the drugs that are available, you know, and there's clearly also a kind of a loss of the, of the more secretive drugs and overuse of some of these more secretive drugs. And I, and I, I, I'm of the proponent kind of belief that at least some of the ingredients of the Soma were lost due to overuse, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's do this real quick. Go back one picture. Everybody look at that picture. Now go forward two pics. Boom. Now oh, we're wow. talking about what you're talking about. Zoroaster, the Zendavesta, Auto Mazda, um, La Masu, Aramon. Um, these are these these winged griffin um, type characters, a bull with wings. Wow. Um, and it's used in Zoroaster and it's part of the Homa ritual. So we're talking about Soma and Homa and fermented um, bovine products. Let's hit the next picture. So this is from an ancient Stella that was found in Persia. Um, on the bottom left, those are two cow heads that have been sacrificed. Oh, Our wow. cows, yeah. And these priests are holding sticks in their hands. These are called barsum bundles. And barsum bundles are a collection of sticks that are used in the Homa ritual in Zoroastrian. Um, it's part of the, the animal is used in a, in a very sacred way. All right, so part of Zoroastrianism is the sacred fire. You gotta keep that fire burning. What keeps it burning? The cow dung. Of course. And the drink that they're imbibing, it deals with taking these sticks that they're infusing in the milk and fermenting. And one of the ingredients they use is called Gomez. Really? You pop that in. Yeah, everyone at home thinks I'm crazy. Take the Gomez challenge. G-O-M-E-Z. Type in go Gomez cow urine. And that's a big thing in Zoroastrianism. It's for purification. Either wow. taro, ning, are Gomez, and they you ferment know, like, the cow urine and you and rub it on their whole body. When That's I was in India, do it. and when I was in India, like they actually sell, like you can go to these Ayurvedic shops and they will have these fermented cow urines, these fermented milks with various herbal remedies that are meant to, to cure you. And I'm also, I think of all, another image that always sticks in my head when I think about the cow is we look at some of these nomadic tribes that still exist to this day in um in africa like um we have the kosa and uh some of the related tribes there and these people will will bathe themselves in the cow urine and it will actually cause their hair to become bleached but what the cow urine does is it acts as a sunblock and a bug repellent yeah. you know and in their natural environment this is necessary like beyond necessary to their to their lifestyle you know lots of properties with the cow um and Brand that image in your mind of the priest with the staff and the cows and the, right. and the sacred drink, yes. you know, that that those sticks can become a spear later on. You know, so let's hit the next pick. So this is still Persian culture. Moving fast forward to Mithra. Evolves out of that culture, Zoroastrianism, where he's sacrificing a bull and he has the Phrygian cap on um, like the other guy was wearing a cap and sacrificing, doing these cow sacrifices. And Mithra was popularized uh, later on by the Roman soldiers and adopted by pirates as well. You know? I also want to point out in this is two other animals that we know are very important to entheogenic husbandry, the dog and the snake that are yep. also attacking the cow here. Yeah, yeah. It's very subtle. It's at the bottom. That's what I'm saying. Wherever you see these bulls or cows, you'll see snakes. It's part of these ancient rituals. Um, yeah, so 
we've made it back to the Middle East there, you know, um, let's let's look at some older versions of this. So Mithra, Mithraism is spread with the Roman culture, you know, at that time. Another one that spread at, around that time is um, Serapis. Right. So let's hit the next pick. And I, I got an image of Serapis. And the Apis bull. Yeah. And there's the bull right there. And it's hard to see, but uh, all those little images of Serapis, he's a snake body with the image of a man with long hair and a beard. Um, originally used to be a bull because in, in Egypt, they have uh, animal headed gods, but they didn't want that at this time period. So they replaced the Apis bull with the man's head. And um, the Apis bull. So we have Serapis and Apis. The way you get that is by combining the word Osiris and Apis, and that's how you get Serapis, Osirapis. And that's Amazing. Osiris and the Apis bull. Hit the next pick and, and we'll really unpack it. Boom. There's Osiris on the back of the Apis bull. Wow. And between the Apis bulls are the, are the cow. It could be the Apis bull or a cow, different versions. I don't have the Uraeus, which deals with the snake in the sun. You know? Yeah, that headpiece. Usually you, 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 he has that wild headpiece. Yeah. 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 And so, um, and there's a lot that's going on with this, you know, and, so when they made Serapis, they unified the Apis bull and, Os and Osiris together and a uniform god for the for all the regions. And his consort was Isis. You know, Isis and Serapis went together, you know, as, as a couple. And it was a big thing. Um, and later on, the Apis bull was associated with Ptah. You know, and, and so now we'll go even in the older myths in Egypt dealing with the cows and the bulls. So hit the next pick. Boom. There's one right there, the Apis bull showing the whole thing with the Uraeus, the, the snake on the ground, the cobra, um, the crook and the tail. Wow. Which are a symbol of pharaonic royalty. Um, it deals with fertility, regeneration. Um, it's a primordial God. This is a very important image, too, because, like, cows will naturally attack snakes. You know, they will, if they see a snake, they'll freak out and try to stomp it, you know, oh, to yeah. their own detriment, too. You know, and there's older um, cow gods in Egypt. There's Hesat, there's uh, Menemphis. Um, Hathor isn't Hathor, Hathor what we're talking about. So let's hit the next pick. And so right there, because I was talking about um, Isis. You know, how Isis was connected to Serapis. Well, here's an old uh, stamp from the Vatican from the 1800s. Um, and it shows how Isis comes together with the Apis bull and a composite bead. And in some of the versions, um, Isis is Hathor. And that's how she nurses uh, Horus. And remember earlier on in the presentation, I showed you how um, the goddess... Uh, Io is is being received by Isis, connecting already in a lot of imagery right there to Hathor, and mm -hmm. Isis is connecting to Hathor. So hit the next pick. I also just think it's so wild that the Vatican is releasing this stamp, and not like oh, Egypt. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Boom! So there's Hathor, um, goddess of love, fertility, cow ears. Um, Probably in music, sound. People say because of the ears, she hears sound a little differently. Um, is involved in a lot of the myths in ancient Egypt. And in one, there's where Ray, Amun, or Amun Ra, gets upset at mankind and turns her into Sekhmet. And she goes mm -hmm. down and she starts eating all the people. And uh, the way to calm her down is through red beer. So wow. they make red beer and flood the Niles and she gets drunk on it and turns back into Hathor and calms her down. You know, that red beer, we talked about that before. And some people say it's with hematite that they're putting in the red beer. And it reminds me of uh, Esau and Jacob, you know, in the, in the red porridge, somebody selling the birthright for a red drink. Right. Or even later with Moses turning the water into 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 blood, you know, oh, yeah. to defeat the Pharaoh's um, uh, magi. So, you know, yeah, this kind of red drink is a central image for sure. And people have different versions of it. You know, so let's hit the next pick. 
there's something that's called the book of the heavenly cow um oh, and some of it it's it's uh new like you know over the sky you know like the, yeah, solar the sky part. mother usually she's yeah. the one who's depicted like yeah you know reaching over the sky yeah. sometimes she's a cow nursing them um the story i just told you about how uh Hathor is turned into Sekhmet, the lion goddess, and goes to kill all the people in Egypt. Well, the survivors ride the back of the heavenly cow. And you oh, notice wow. they get their little ships there as well. You know. That's so cool. You know, and there's a book called The Book of the Heavenly Cow, and it goes back. And so um, let's hit the next picture, because we've talked about also uh, catfish, Narmer, in past episodes. And Narmer, there's the Narmer palette, is one of the oldest things they've found. Um, you could see the the bovine imagery at the top there, and at the bottom, I don't know if you could see. There's a a bull that's destroying a little shape. It's attacking that shape, and the which is that half circle shape and that familiar uh, shape that we show in other episodes. Right. Oh, that's so interesting. Oh yeah, you know, um, the image goes very deep in Egypt. So much so, um, let's hit the next pick. I know we're going fast. So here we go. We were talking about those cow patties. And there they are drying them on the wall. That's what those are, drying them on the wall. There's authors that talk about ah, methane production in ancient Egypt. Methane production in India, Zoroaster. Because now think about this. Cow dung has an anaerobic bacteria that presents the conditions to turn into methane gas. People talk about that all the time. Too many cows, the methane gas. Right. You know, so mm -hmm. methane production. Back in the day, that methane would methane production would have been a good thing when we didn't have electricity. And so that's part of the sacredness of the cow and that sacred fire deals with the methane production and the, the dung, the cow dung. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we forget. We often you think in North America, we have so many trees, you know, and we use wood for our fires. They, th th this is not a luxury in the desert. <laughs> you know, you can't you have to use uh, the animal feces, you know, and, you, and your cow is your best bet for this. Now, thinking about that in the methane at the Oracle of Delphi. What was there? Uh, what was the magic spirit, the pneumonia or what was it that that? Gave him the power. It was a methane gas that came through the cracks, no? That's true, yeah. It was uh, from the, well, speculation, but they speculate part of it was this huffing of this volcanic gas, you know? Just saying. <clears throat> All righty. So let's explore that theme a little, a little more. Next picture, please. Ball. There's Ball right there. We know Ball as a, as a thunder god and a bull sacrifices to Ball. Um, Ball has this thing in his hand. Remember I was talking about the bars and staffs? And this is called Ball's Thunder Spear. Vegetative Thunder wow. Spear. I want to Remember? point out that it almost looks exactly like the Thyrsus and how the Thyrsus is described as both a giant stalk and a weapon, you know? Yeah. And look at that cap. Doesn't that remind you of the Phrygian cap, you know? So, so in this mythology... Ball's thunder staff strikes the ground, producing thunder. Psh. You know, um, it deals with methane gas. It deals with mushrooms growing after lightning. This is the bovine thing. But this is something we're, we're, we're very familiar with, right? Usually, if a lightning strike happens, mushrooms will, 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 will start to grow wherever the lightning hits, you know? And almost certainly, our ancestors would have noticed this. And then the cow dung, cow dung, like mushrooms will grow in the cow dung, you know? Oh. This, and if they're burning this cow dung, they're going to, and they're dealing with this cow dung, they're going to be dealing with mushrooms. And we said this before, but Carl Ruck points out that even the 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 name mushroom is onomatopoeia for the sound a cow makes. <laughs> Just say Boan Erges, the sons of thunder. You know, and Ammon, as well as other scholars, we'll have to talk to Ammon about this, connect this ball, this lord of the high place, to Bacchus, you know, especially if you look at Baal Zebul, 
or, you know, either Lord of the Flies or Lord of the High Place. These are both kind of epithets we have associated with Bacchus. And he makes a linguistic uh, connection between um, Balzebub and this uh, figure we see within the Eleusinian mysteries of Bacchus Ebulius, you know? So we'll unpack that more with the doctor, but it's almost certainly connected. So let's hit the next pick and we'll go fast. Boom, Moloch. Remember talking about the, it's a bronze, it was, it was a statue that was filled with fire. Remember this, we're talking about the bronze that was Jason with the fire breathing bronze hoofs, those bulls. Um, oh, it, the, the bull and fire and sacrifice and regeneration goes together in these themes. So we're not saying no anti-Semitic stuff, nothing right here. We're just showing you history, showing you some history stuff in that area right there. Let's hit the next pick. Yeah, we know that this Moloch is kind of a very um, dangerous figure and becomes used to cause a lot of hatred. But this is something that these people were believing and they were weaponizing this mythology against each other. You know, you see you, you see various communities you, making these claims. You worship Moloch. You're sacrificing children to the cow. You know, yeah. so. so here's Jeroboam, King Jeroboam, and he made golden calves. Um, it's in it's in their text there in the Bible. Um, they're worship them. They like the cows. This cow worship, it goes way back, you know, in the fire and the sacrifice. So we'll hit the next pick. Boom. Exodus. Take some of the blood of the bull and put it on the horns of the altar with your finger. Then pour out the rest of the blood at the base of the altar. Horns of the altar. So the, the altar has horns even. Just saying, and taking the blood of the bull, hit the next pick. Boom, one more. And then he took the calf that they had made, burned it, burned it in the fire, ground it in the powder, and scattered the powder over the face of the water. And then he forced the Israelites to drink it, forced them to drink it. The golden calf. When he came down the mountain, Moses was pissed off because they were worshiping a golden calf. But he made him drink it, which is a pharaonic practice, which is actually good for him. It wasn't a bad thing. But let's hit the next pick. Speaking of Moses and, and golden calves. So in the first saying, he was putting bloods on the horns of the altar. That was for Moses. And then he made him drink the golden calf. And then in a lot of art, he's represented with horns. People will say because it was his face was shining after he knew the Lord, which means to have sex with the Lord, by the way. But <laughs> he had horns. Um, yeah. Let's hit the next pick. We're going fast. Boom. So at uh, Bathsheba which is Trump Heights, Golan Heights, they found these bovine Yahweh L's. Oh, wow. That's connected it's to L? L? Yeah. It, yeah, there's a bovine Yahweh right here. And they're buried. And you notice he has a stick, his little staff too. Um, people also say that it's connected to asteroids. We'll talk about that in a later episode, the asteroid connections, the meteorites. But uh, these are the older bovine L's in Yahweh's. You know, the horns, we're talking about this calf worship. So with that said, hit the next pick. Yeah. So we have, we have the manger scene with Christos. And, of course, you got set on the left there is the donkey. And then you got the bull there on the right. The cow. Wow. You know, you, you got to have that at the, the cow or bull at the birth. It's very important, these animals. And some people can say that's astral theology. But this is part of their mythology. You know, so it, it would have to be there. So with that said, we're going to hit one more pick before we bring the doctor on. So right here, this is a black Madonna of a lot. So some of these black Madonnas they found, this one has a cow with it or the bull with it. And the name is Madre de du, del Tura, the mother of God of the bull. That's amazing. Wow. There's always this deep connection between these mother goddess figures and the cow, you know? And the asteroid and yeah. the meteorites. So the, the meteorites, the, the mother, and that's the name, the mother of God of the bull, Madre de Du de Teltura. So, you know, there's a connection there. With that said, you know, if the doctor's ready, bring him on. So, Doctor, if you're out there, come join. <laughs> we'll oh, give him yeah. a second. I oh, saw yeah. him in the chat, but I'm sure he'll be around. But let's unpack some of this a little bit while we're waiting for, for Ammon to come on. So if we're going, I want to go back to this image where we're talking about of um, with, um, 
well, if we go back here, there's some wild stuff here near the beginning here. Some of this Greek stuff, you know, with, where was it? Yeah, Jason and the Bulls. I want to ask Ammon about this. What's actually going on with these fire bulls and the bronze? Because as you pointed out, there's a connection to this Malok, right? And there's this, there's this kind of fighting that's going on in this transformation. Well, I'm seeing a lot of symbolism. First, there's this wrestling going on, this taming or subduing. One bull is black, one is white. They have bronze hoofs, like these other symbologies in other cultures. They breathe fire. And the way he could overcome them is through Medea making a, a herbal potion that he rubs on his whole body. So this is, is this an alchemical formula? Is this a sexual ritual? What is this? Right? It's so wild, you know, and it's such a deep image. Hi, Ammon. Thanks for joining us. How's it going? It's going well, Snappy. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed it. I, I heard there was going to be a party today, so I was like, you got to go. <laughs> I'm glad you made it. I mean, I we all listened to you the other night on that uh, podcast episode. That was amazing. I just wanted to give a shout out. Everyone should go check out Ammon's channel, Lady Babylon 666. He has a link you can follow to listen to him on the Forbidden Knowledge podcast. And he gets into all of his dark theories. It's one of the better rundowns of your total kind of project that I've heard. So I really love that interview. I, I like the fact that he um, went to the Gospel of Mark and actually dug up the naked boy. I was hoping he would do that. So. <laughs> he right? was surprised. He's like, oh, he was right. <laughs> They always are. It was. I was like, is he actually going to bring it up? Ammon, Ammon gave him the actual freaking thing. And then he's like, oh. <laughs> it's stuff like the pornea. I, I would have loved to have seen his face because I'm sure he was freaking out over some of that stuff. Well, mind but. you, he has his own viewership and sponsors and, and life to think about, you know, because this is challenging topics we get stalkers trolls people try to shadow ban the channels you know putting this stuff out there it you it triggers people basically that's what happens it triggers it does why is it such a trigger you know i don't understand him and it's just like we, we we've transformed drugs and sex into such a taboo that even their bare mention especially associated with something that people take as sacred is enough to to have people like you know seizing <laughs> or frothing at the mouth it's 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 gotten it's gotten quite wild <laughs> so you know i got a question for armin there go ahead go ahead Which i was going to say here I, for you i was going to say I thought you guys were doing an excellent job and you were looking at the um, thief, um, the clops and whatnot. And w th this is fantastic. Um, beautiful job. I want to be able to tell my cow story too. Um, sorry, Dion, okay. I'll stop. Well, no, that's what I was going to ask you about dealing with the, with the Greek, which one of those stories uh, is juicy to you with Zeus and these cow stories and Daedalus. Well, you know, I didn't know much of this stuff. This is not the, the Greek that they teach you in classics, isn't it? You know? Yeah, the, the cow that really turns me on is Io. Um, because embedded within the language is the progression of the myth and hence the mystery. Um, it, um, that estrus that we see, this mania that we see, you can see this in the in the real world, right? There was a beautiful cow, 1244, I'll never forget her, 1244, and I was out doing milkings one night, and she came up behind me, and I, you know, to be honest, I had given her a little bit of a rub down, friendly rub down, because she was acting funny, and I was, you know, messing around with her a little bit. Well, apparently it was turned her on, because she was in, she was in estrus, she was an estrus, and that means she was ready to mate. And these cows are so central um, to this old Mycenaean culture 
that um, all of this imagery is absorbed and injected into the into the language. And um, that's what that oystrous is. Io is in that state, that state of mania. She wanders and she's in, in this constant throes of, of passionate agony. It's the agony that we all want, right? It's that agony of the mating. And so um, th this was a big deal with the, when you talk about the myth of Io. Um, anyhow, she pushed me over in the long story short, she pushed me over and got rough. And I was like, no, lady, this is not my thing. And I managed, <laughs> to, managed to get away from it. But if you've never seen a cow in estrus, it's a marvelous thing. Um, or even a mare come into season. Yeah, yeah. If you have you ever any anywho, the cows are fantastic, and it we have to look at it's such a central part. You hit a whole bunch of myths that had exactly, you know, right up front, the thieving, catalyst sun, all that kind of stuff, connections. This is all good bronze age stuff, and it's still forcing its way into the language. I love that. You guys did a fantastic job today so question is a cyclops deals with the cattle thief you know it comes from the derivation of the word cuclops so um it could be proposed that the clops ending of it um meaning thief um i don't i don't you know the verb is klepto to steal and or the word for thief is kleptes just somebody who's, who takes right Okay, so um, the clops there is a form. It's using the same root for thief. But here's the problem. Kuklops can also be um, divided into two roots in Greek, the kukul, the circle, and the ops, the gaze, the expression. And if that's the case, if that's a reality, it's got nothing of thievery in it. Um, right. But but if that's not the case, yes, it is possible that clops root could be part of the kuklops. Yeah, yeah. The they center have of the circle, the eye at the center of the circle. Yeah, yeah. The gaze. What do you think that gaze is? It's something about being in those altered states that there is some kind of power within the gaze. And um, I've always wanted to kind of explore that and figure out what that was, but. I've never gotten there. You know what I mean? What is the power of the, why is it? Let me ask you this, Dion. Um, why is it that the cyclopes are producing lightning? Ooh. Yeah. You know, lightning and thunder is central to the theme here. The spark, the all spark, you know, the methane. And that's what, what I was looking into was methane and the sacred fire from the cow dung because we don't we use electricity nowadays so i wouldn't know that i would have known that back in ancient times that that cow dung is is sacred and also the thing i wanted to ask you was about zeus's epitaphs one being astarte you know the str root astr root in there yeah what's the connection with that in the in the cows because we always see the star related to the cow you know, both on yeah. the feminine and the masculine side. Astropaeus is one of his, for example, one of his titles that uses that STR or Sigma Tau Rho root. And it is, again, that bright flash, that lightning in the sense of the overwhelming um, um, visual force of it. Yeah. So, again, lightning goes back to lightning. How does the EOS, by the way, IO is just a shout, right? Again, Eve, shout of the Bacchus, Bacchus, right? Ewa or Ewai, those are shouts that Bacchus do, right? Eo, another shout. And who's going to be doing the shout? Those who were in the mania, those who were in the oysters, right? So, um, again, all you're seeing with Io, remember, at the close of the Bronze Age, with the Greek historians who were writing later come out and say, hey, you know, there's a bunch of stuff that started off with the abductions of these special, these special people, Io and Europa. And you guys hit the coverage of Europa perfectly, right? 
um, with a Zeus, the bull on her on his back. And, you know, there's an old saying um, in Greek that you can only quench the ardor of the virgin, right, with the fire. Uh, excuse me. You can only quench the ardor of the bull with the um, voice or the breath of the virgin, which is interesting. But you have these four abductions, one of which is Medea. Right. And and people will say, oh, the, this one was in response to that one was in response to that one. And so here's my question. What are so special about these cows? There's something seriously special about these cows that I'm going to get a whole bunch of my young warriors together. We're going to put all our resources into sailing over to your place. We're probably going to die somewhere in between. But if we get there, we're going to steal one of these cows. We're going to bring back the sacred, the sacred cow. It's um, we're the dogs of Heracles. Were they real dogs? <laughs> you know, it's uh, this is something I want to ask you, Ammon. Is like in that story where where Odysseus goes and and, and he steals the cows from um, from Helios. First, why does Helios? have all of these cows and then why does odysseus immediately sacrifice them to the other gods knowing he's going to get punished by helios he's even warned by circe like what does he hope to gain from all of this what are you gonna are you not gonna give helios his perfect cows do you have a problem snappy with helios <laughs> having perfect cows I just wonder I why he holds them and wants to reserve them for himself. You know, yeah, it's seven, kind of herds. seven herds, if I'm not mistaken. They're brilliant. They shine, right? In the description of them, they shine like the sun. There is that oracular connection through the house of the sun. They call them the daughters of the sun, these people that we're talking about, right? Well, that whole a tradition of Apollo and the oracles comes from that older worship of the house of the sun. So though, what are those cows doing there? Those cows are just like the Io or the Europa, right? Or the Medwa. They're just, they're the same. You're taking this resource, right? And oh, why is the sun going to have them? Because the sun is oracular. It's old oracular Bronze Age religion. And that's why you guys... We both mentioned the stars, why the stars come into it, right? Because as soon as you start talking about the house of Helios, you're going to talk about the sun, the moon, the stars, and all the as snappy, you were saying, all the drawing down of those yeah, there powers. Was, yeah. There's one image that I wanted to bring up that we see so prominent in, in Minoan Crete, which is that you have the horns that are on the altar that we see with the later Jewish and Greek mysteries. But the one that's so prominent at Minos, the moon will actually perfectly line up on the solstice and will be in between those horns and then there'll be stars above it. So it creates this almost the same image we see that it's associated with the, what was it called on the Egyptian bull? The, the Opus bull, the Uraeus. The Uraeus. So what's going on there with drawing down the moon into the bull? <laughs> it's like so ancient and so wild and prominent. We see the same image in Harappa as well, you know, it's half a world away. It's cross-cultural and it's the same mystery, right? There's no national boundaries. Right. I mean, technically there are. Right. You'll have so much territory. Right. And you know, the extent of Egypt and how it changes. But the culture isn't stopped by those boundaries. So a lot of the same, you know, people snappy, you know how it works. People are always surprised that Bacchic cult is so prominent and that it's always related back to some Phrygian great mother um, cult. Right. You've always got Sibley somewhere in the back lurking in the background and people that well, it's because there weren't those borders between where the people spoke the languages. They didn't really stop the transfer of religious culture. And so, you, you know, you, you get it. The names will change a little bit. But, you know, when you're Hipta and you're worshiping um, according to Saba and Thrace, you're doing the same thing if you're a Bacchic on the shores of the Black Sea, anywhere along the Black Sea. 
Um, and that stuff filters in, it, it, it comes in. You were asking about, um, you were asking about the thief. Why was the thief so interesting with the related to the cattle? And what? Cause we have all this cattle stealing stuff going on so much so that we've got one God who's, it's like, you know, his thing. Yeah. yeah. Hermes is like central myth is the stealing of, 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 of that. Right. And he's also, you know, the one who invents language and communication and is one of the gods that's more close to humanity. So what's going on there? Unpack that for us. Are you kidding me? Or at least are, are you kidding me? I couldn't unpack that snappy if I tried. I, all I could say is, <laughs> all I could say is um, I've observed that it's a big part. It's a big part of the worship of Hermes, that whole theft thing, and that whole um, thieves association, thieves art kind of thing. Um, why is it so important that right after Hermes is entered into the moisture, right? Why is it that right after he does that, he gets out of his cradle and he goes out and he um, steals the cattle of Apollo? And then yeah. he's so he's so smart, he winds them up backwards, right? Makes it look like they were going the other way. Nice job. Why is that so important for the 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 divinity that is able to function? Rem remember, he's an angelos, and any time that there's some kind of transference between the three dimensions that they they looked at as Uranos and Gaia, and then Chthon the under um that uh hermes permeates all of those right he's he's that element that's able to slip between them so when zeus goes to sodom and gomorrah oh wait a minute it's not sodom and gomorrah yes it is um when, <laughs> when zeus goes he takes hermes with him and they, and they had this saying in antiquity um that you you know it wasn't a saying i mean they had this admonition that um you better treat uh foreigners well Sp strangers people you don't know you better treat them well because hermes and zeus dress up and they come and visit your city and who is hermes hermes we know is zeus's angelos he's the divine angel or messenger right he's able to make that connection to humans and so um you know treat foreigners or guests strangers treat them well because you know so someday zeus is going to show up and, you know then you get in trouble you try to serve him your kid chopped up in a wait what <laughs> yeah you try to serve him your child carved up to test him to see if he's a if he's a theos isn't that isn't that who would put that in your how is that sometimes you're reading myth and you stop and you think this these people they're so different they must have been on drugs or something yeah they were but um it's just a different way is it like a different perspective of, of totally the world? Yeah. do you think well, there's you know, a if I, oh, go if ahead, I, could, I wanted to unpack the hermes cattle myth a little bit more because we didn't discuss how he does it well, in some of the myth, he makes the cattle walk backwards. They backtrack into a cave. Yeah. And then he has these special sandals that he has made that put the imprint backwards so that they can't know. So so it deals with the hoof because we've talked about the hoofs before, the secret meaning and hoofs and things. Um, yeah, it deals with the, the footprint. It's how Hermes gets away with it. And they have to go into a cave, mind you. He takes his little uh, his herd into a cave, his sheepkins. Yeah, and notice notice that his mother Dion, um, she's the one goddess. Now factor this in. Tell me how this works. What piece is that? His mother is the only goddess who um, has a place directly on Olympus, who refuses um, to inhabit it, but prefers the earth, which all the other goddesses know. Earth sucks. <laughs> so but she's the one and she lives in a cave she lives in a cave and um with hermes and the really weird thing is that nobody ever grabs onto her name means 
I assist in birth or I bring about birth, right? She's the, she's the midwife. I mean, it literally means midwife. Mm. <laughs> right? This is really, how do you pronounce, I can't, I can never pronounce this word, her name. It's like Eliot. Can you say her name for us? Oh, Eleutheria. Eleutheria. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Or Eleutheria. Excuse me. You're thinking probably the goddess of childbirth, which yeah. is Eleutheria. Eleutheria. Um, yeah, no, that's like, a, uh, okay, that's really an epithet, right? It's not a straight up name. Could that be Maya, though? Usually when you're talking about the goddess of the midwifery and of bringing children into the world, you're talking about Maya. And it also just means grandmother, right? It also just means grandmother. Now, Elethwia is a specialized title that the Orphix developed for her. And there's a hymn that talks about that. And I think it's so important because there we see the connection in Elethwia with um, the use of the um, oystron in inducing birth. So the use of the poison that they're using on their arrows around the Black Sea to induce birth. And therefore the, the queen or the Wanasa, who is the physician, right? She um, is using this oystrous to bring you to a place that you can um, give birth. Right. It's kind of like, I don't know. It's like they took their religious communion from um, substances that they knew would be able to do certain things to your bodies, um, to your to your body. But this is all kind of Maya and Elethuia and the whole there's a whole bunch of stuff, too, with um, Apollo and Lucifera or I'm sorry, Diana. Um, that you talk, um, that you, you um, that have to do with this. Yeah, because uh, Elethia is the midwife for Apollo and Diana, and there's all that weird stuff. It's, well, she's midwife for many different gods. I can, it's it's so wild that this comes up because I was just researching into this after a friend asked me about her, and I and what I was finding was all of this connection. Like she brings the birth of Athena, the child to come. Right. And when you look into the etymology of her name, I would see it, it shows like it's both a giving birth, but also to bring it back. So that there's this, it seems to me like there's an Orphic image embedded in here where she's the one who can show you how to return back to the one kind of thing. And there's also, she changes the, the, changes the time of birth for Heracles and so forth and therefore changes his stars. So there's also all of that going on too. Yeah, and if you realize as a witch, right, as a witch, you can affect somebody's future. You can cause, you can shape that birth of that child because you are caught, you have the chemicals to be able to endure, induce birth, right? It's just whatever the oxytocin is, right? It's kicking in the uter uterine contraction. It's they've determined, they've figured out. Their, their arrow poison will activate this process and will numb the woman, right? Which I thought was interesting. I thought, well, that's an, that's an interesting, you know, take on it. They, there's even one type of birth they talk about where it puts the woman into a, the phase that is right before sleep. So it's like a heavy sedative or something. And then while she is in that state, you'd think, well, doesn't she have to push along? Doesn't she have to move with her contractions? They claim that they could get her to produce a child while she was in that torpor and then be revived out of it. And they said it was more, better for the person. I thought when the first time I came across that, I thought, are you kidding me? I, I knew their abortion was advanced. I mean, they've got abortions that'll just, you know, you just, you can make it you can make a milkshake. You know what I mean? You can make a milkshake of your, of your seed, right? And um, you can harvest that soul. Um, now, and you think, oh my God, this is terrible, right? Save the children, save the children. Um, you've got to realize how they're, um, how they're dealing with things that, you know, like birth that you and I take for granted. When a third of people die, third of women die in childbirth, things are going to be a little bit, you know, you're going to, 
This is essential, right? Yeah, yeah. I also wanted to ask you, because you keep bringing up this thiefing imagery, and I'm immediately confronted with the, you know, one of the older myths, the, the Titan Prometheus stealing the fire. Does that also relate to this cow theft, do you think? The, oh, that's a great question. That's a great question. Um, I hadn't considered Ooh. it. Because I, I keep always seeing the cow <laughs> associated with the fire, and the cow is also always associated with the great mother. You know, and so it seems very connected, at least on the surface. Yeah. You know, if you if you take the ooze from his liver um, and you put it on the ground, it'll cause a plant to grow that will make you super high. You will be so high you won't feel flame. OK, now that's where I was going to ask you the next question. It deals with Medea's potion. She had to rub down Jason with his whole body get them all naked and baptize them with the chrism. And I want to know if it was uh, arrow poison to conquer the the, the bulls. Right. You know, yeah. I want to know what that body rub is. That's what I want to know. Yeah. Does Galen talk about it? Is there any hints? Here's, yeah, here's the, okay. So yes, yes, and yes. Are there hints to it? Yes. Now we know it's properties, whatever it was that she was using on him. And remember, everybody's like, you'll never, Right. Um, Jason gets there and this 12 year old girl um, comes out and everybody knows right away that she's the only one who can get him to get by um, to pass those fire breathing bulls. Right. He's the only one who's able to get past them. Uh, uh, she is. So she has something. Medea has something that allows him to overcome whatever a fire breathing bull is okay now just and don't be surprised now hang on what does it mean to breathe the fire what does it mean to breathe the fire and a lot of people have said oh these are mechanical objects right they had some kind of they had some kind of furnace thing worked up i don't think that's a bad guess um i think it's much more likely that the bulls and the dragons and the wolves um, just as they were associated with the temple as people. I think it's very, very likely that these bulls that were guarding this relic that nobody could get by, that um, Badia had a drug combo, and we know that she's working with the, um, the petroleum products, and we know that ultimately she, in, she develops an incendiary that devastatingly um, changes history. So, um, you know, the Greek Navy picks it up. So, and we know that she, it's also said of her in Flaccus, that she is able to do something called breathing the fire that is so spectacular, it brings magi all the way, um, you know, freaks, like old style Etruscan stuff, all the way over from the West, it brings them East to see her do this. So um, she can do something special with it. So your question is, what the hell's going on? What is she giving him? Um, what do we know about it? It um, kills his pain. It invigorates him. It makes him invulnerable to fire. And it seems to give him some kind of special strength, some kind of, you know, stamina that he's going to be able to overcome these bulls. And he does. He How does. did he overcome them? Does he wrestle with them? Yeah, he doesn't kill them. Yeah, that's the question. Yeah. He, he subdues them. Yeah. He tames them. Hmm. And one's white and one's black. Hmm. What are you? What are you gonna? What are you gonna? Um, what are you gonna call those, Dion? Can I tell you how many classicists have tried to figure out what the hell's going on? Hmm. It would seem that 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 this is a giant alchemical formula. You know, if you can unpack it correctly, this is not your regular myth right here. You know, just animals and people fighting. And it, it seems so basic and simple on the surface. It's got a relic, too. And whenever we've got relics or possessions that can be plundered, and they do, they plunder it and take it back to Thessaly, right? <laughs> That's their Corinth, wherever they end up. Um, uh, Yolkis, I, I can't remember. Um, they it, it's plundered but when you have an object like that that's a material thing 
And you can make a bridge to the actual culture. You can do the anthropology with all of those physical concrete connections and the drugs are all there. So um, the question is, is we know it's got, we know that only Medea and remember it says in Flaccus, he says she takes that drug that she anoints him with from her colpos. Carl Rock, just so you know, I'm not making it up. Carl Rock is, he's written about that and said, yeah, this is the vagina. She's removing the drug from her vagina, a drug that's so powerful that it enables this knuckleheaded, young, but very good looking prince. Jesus? Uh, yeah, Jesus. Jesus <laughs> the first. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Wait, is this a boat full of boys again? Well, they're stealing <laughs> oh, cattle. They don't steal boys. In this version, they steal cattle. But it seems to me, though, that the cattle could also be a reference to the virgin. You know, um, on the Indian side, we always see them associated with this Aditi, this mother goddess that exists outside of time that represents the vast cosmic space. Makes me think of the Nyx. And also, it's related the sacrifice to this establishment of the cosmic order of maintaining life, of causing the sun to rise. Do you see anything in the Greek associated with this sacrifice of cows and the sun rising or cosmic order being maintained at all? Oh, God. The first thing that came to mind was, uh, I was at Luxor, I think it was, and there was, a, um, there was an image that was just like that. Um, and it had this stretched out entity and the sun going down and coming back out of the chaos. And it was that divine um, boost that was there. Um, yeah. Uh, but not, not in, yeah, that's the boost, right? The, um, you know why Hera is the most beautiful goddess? Because she has the ops she has the eyes that are like the cow is oh, wow. B is for bovine so bovine comes from boobs yeah of course it's greek like everything <laughs> that's so interesting because as soon as you bring up the ops right we, it, this immediately makes me think of another one of these um goddesses that we see associated with the str in the stars asterope Right, she has that starry face, the white face. You know, uh, what is going on with this in this <laughs> connection to the bulls? I'll answer that. I'll answer that if you tell me. You guys put this this stuff up there that was just plain, plain, straight up dirty, <laughs> and it was a cow, a hollowed out cow. <laughs> with yeah, I'll bring that image back because that was a woman feed wild with yeah, a woman diedless. Daedalus made made that outfit for her. Yeah, yeah. It had to take, you know why? Because it had to be well-crafted, man. You can't get into a venture like this without, you know, going in with brains. I mean, this is a queen that we're talking about, right? And that queen is entering into a communion with the bull, right? Now, we have the same thing with donkey. We have the same thing with donkey and Apuleius. So um, it's not a, it's it's not un, uh, unknown within magic circles that in order to enter in order to enter into a union with the divine to produce that child from the star, right? You know why they named him that, don't you? <laughs> Anyhow, um, in order to produce that union, you have to enter into that cow, right? You have to enter into that force. It's the the divine manifesting itself bringing bringing entering moisture they call it oysters and, are up. yeah in order for her to have the minotaur this is magic man phaedra was no joke um this is magic uh, and she had she only brought the minotaur about this way um and now you ask yourself okay anthropologically what is going on what i mean that we've got myths about mating interspecies stuff going on here people olympias is having sex with snakes right on crete they're having sex with bulls and they're producing these you know 
kind of hybrid, scary kind of things. You had Moses there with the horns. That's the most minotauric expression of a human being that could possibly be. Whoever did that, I think it was Mike. And that was yeah, genius. Yeah, Michelangelo. You know, hey, you know the genius. other thing I was going to tell you too was Dionysus Taurus. You know, when I saw that version of Dionysus with the cow horns, you know, I always think of him as a as a goat, a horny goat kind of a guy. But and there he, are some versions of Dionysus as a bovine with the boys. Yeah, and he's also connected to this myth of the the Minotaur, right? Because in the story of Ariadne, because he's the he's the husband of Ariadne after she gets she gets abandoned by Theseus and he runs off with her sister. Right? Yeah, Theseus Theseus like Jason was a punk was a punk right and everybody knew that and dionysus um stepped in and that's one of the most beautiful um pictures i think from antiquity too. who what who does she become she becomes the bride of dionysus and he says i'm gonna make you a constellation right i'm gonna make you this is a woman who is rejected by one of the princes one of the athenian princes piece of garbage you know, and it's and they're, so they're similar scared. to Medea because, again, right? What Theseus gets all the credit for defeating the Minotaur and well, Asterion, but it's only because of Ariadne telling him what he needs to do and giving him the help. And then he spurns her; he breaks his promise. It's ridiculous. Notice it's the it's the wisdom that's coming from that female side constantly, and I don't think that's you know accidental. Even you were talking about. <laughs> You were talking about Ilithuia Il earlier. Um, all of that knowledge is wrapped up. All the drug knowledge is wrapped up on that feminine side. And if you can't admit that, you can't see Lucifera, right? The bringer, the bringer of dawn, who is that great, that incredibly enabled physician, right? Would you be surprised to know that the earliest great physicians were women? You know, um, you might be. But like, uh, what's your name from Harvard tells us or Oxford or Cambridge, you know, women didn't do anything in antiquity. So, <laughs> yeah, enjoy. Gotta love those second wave feminists. <laughs> oh, man. But I also wanted to unpack, we were looking at that figure of ball. And you have referenced this a couple of times in our conversations, as well as in your own episodes, that this ball is connected to Bacchus. You know, we see, I, I mean, to me, it screams that with just the epithets, Lord of the High Place or Lord of the Flies. And, but you've connected uh, Beelzebub to Eubulius. Can you unpack some of that for us? Yeah, Eubulius is a weird, it's a it's a weird epithet for Dionysus that goes way back to whatever. I've seen proposals. Well, you know, it's something to do with good counsel, right? That's pretty generic, and I don't know if that fits, but um, it is an epithet that's used of him. And when you find it used, the root of it used in the magic. So um, you're going to find Eubulius within the magic. And so when Jesus is saying, you know, the Baal Zebul or Baal Zabul, that Za is just an intensifier. We know that it's just an intensifier. It just blows up the action of whatever it's preceding. Um, and so who, who is that incredibly good counseling ball? Um, probably Baal Hamon, probably related to the North African stuff. Right. I mean, yeah, you're transferring. It's geographical now. Um, you're now in North Africa and up into the Levant. Right. And you're you're getting into Phoenician um, and Libyan stuff. Right. Um, yeah. So that's where I've seen it snappy. That's all I've had. it. And I know there are people who are like, oh, this is the derivation of what it means in high places. And what They can scream that stuff all they want. What I think is cool is that when you're making drugs, you got to know stuff about Baal Hamon. I thought, that's cool. You know, you can see where it's from, at least where they're doing all those drugs and rites and whatnot. Yeah, love it. Yeah, it's amazing stuff. But let's go back to this um, Dionysus Tauros that, uh, that Dion brought up. Can you unpack that image? Because yeah, that one has seemed so strange, and it's not an epithet I was aware until Dion brought it forward. Yeah, Kerastes. K 
Kerastes or Tauropol, right? Um, the Tauropol is the one who brings that bull force within the cult. Um, what's your, um, up on up on Snake Island um, is the Tauropol. They call Artemis the Tauropol. Well, these um, kind of <sighs> epithets become connected with the image of what you and I now call the horned Dionysus. And people are like, what, what are the horns? Nonus, the author Nonus, if anybody's really interested. And I've had people ask me, what do the horns represent? Right? Like, what's the, and I know you guys were talking about a little bit earlier with Moses and his horns. And, you know, some people say it's a halo, right? And that's a thousand years off the mark, but it's a fun way, way, to, way to play a game. But those horns, Nonus, who is a cult master, right? People don't realize we have a cult master, we have a mystery master in Nonus. And his imagery is, is um, he's got so many hopox legomena words that are only mentioned once. He either coined half of them or they're just real esoteric words that you're not going to find other places, right? It's too esoteric. So um, he, he's got the uh, kerastes. He explains over time through the, all of the books, explains what that kerastes is. And um, it turns out that Kerastes is the source of, and you guys know this because you've been talking about this stuff ancillarily. Um, it is what holds that lightning drink, <laughs> you know. It is, it is the horn that Isis, right, will grow. It's the, um, that lunar phase of the horns. Um, it is that power those horns on the altar, um, all of that um, Nonus takes and wraps up together in the notion that the God's power is focused through the horns, which kind of makes sense because if cows and bulls are so important in antiquity and they're all over the place, and like you guys showed, they're jumping over them, they're bull vaulting, as they used to call it, um, in Crete. If it's that important, it only makes sense that you know, we've got this image of where is the individual's power, right? The power is in the horns, right? That, that ability to drive and that ability to pierce, right, is in there. So um, Nonus does a great job, does a great job. And you don't get your horns. You don't get your horns unless they're bestowed by a divine power. So the magus or the sorcerer, or the witch, doesn't work unless their horns have been granted. <laughs> and I just want to take a second and, and thank you for inter reintroducing me to Nonus, because, you know, my, I have a degree, right, in humanities, and I did some classical studies, but my professors had me convinced that Nonus was fifth century Christian, um, making stuff up, just, just a writer of, of, of popular fiction, you know, and if you really wanted the real authenticity, you had to go to Homer, you had to go to, you know, the Argonautica, not to, or to the inscriptions, not to Nonus. So uh, thank you for, for, for pr showing us that Nonus is this cult figure who knows what he's talking about, even if he is in the fifth century and working under that Christian lens. Yeah, and you can look at his language and you can, for example, say, um, look, he's using Nicander, who is a, a priest who writes about drugs and antidotes, right? Which this person who was talking to you about Nonus probably doesn't know, right? Um, you can see within Nonus um, the use of Nicander. So that tells you right away, oh, my God, this guy's using a specialized vocabulary that comes through a priestly line. Right, because Nicander, and everybody knows about Nicander. He was that prominent. Um, so, okay, okay, cool. Yeah, I don't think that, yeah, I don't think, I'm glad that you can dig into the um, Dionysus. Uh, I mean, into the, um, into the Nonesus Dionysiaca. I was working with a grad student on that um, snappy, um, a class, and there's nothing that will stretch you more 
than his imagery. And the only way to capture his imagery is to go back to his sources and to say, how are they using it? And cults say that we're Hellenistic, right? Well, they're using it this way, right? And this time he borrows from an old, old, um, looks like it's Homeric um, use of the word, right? And it makes sense for the sake of whatever the context is for the cult. So there is so much in Nonus's Dionysiaca. You, um, for, for example, let me just give you the breast milk of the virgin, right? You find it in Nonus. The goat, right? The, the one that turns into the shield of, or the aegis of Athena on which you put the head of Medusa, right? Um, the milk of that goat, Amalthea, is there. And why is that milk special? He, he describes Athena as the nurse herself. And she's the nurse with her grape-like breasts. And you can go straight to Galen and find those grape-like breasts. And you can say, oh, they're using them for specific ailments. It's a medical thing, right? Um, very uh, straight up. I mean, there's no, I don't have any theories about this. I don't have any ideas. You just have to pull out that evidence and say, Jesus, look at the sophistication of the biochemistry that they're doing here. It's amazing. I'm, I'm shocked. I'm, you know, speaking of the biochemistry, it was multiple episodes back that I consulted the AI and asked them if the cows there in Greece ate air guitars dry, could their milk produce LSA? And it said, sure. It produces LSA. <laughs> it and we know that milk was a uh, uh, featured heavily in the Ellicinian mysteries. Another possibility, Dion. Another possibility of them using a species as a way of creating a, a drug. Yeah, but brilliant. It's it, it's polypharmacy. It's thinking beyond the level. You know, we think one drug. You know, one disease, one drug. Boom, and you get this, and it causes so many side effects and whatnot. It has nothing to do with the balance. It's a very stupid approach to medicine because it doesn't take into account the balance. And I, let me ask you guys what you think about this. Um, in, in inducing the physical changes they do in the Medusae, where they get the rough and scaly skin, the girl becomes taller, but a head taller than the average man, they said. So you know, six, six, maybe. Um, maybe six, between six and six, six, somewhere like that. Um, and she gets the scaly skin and she gets the eyes that are injected and the photosensitivity and the increased aggression, the increased aggression. And with all of that, because of the regimen that we're keeping her on, she becomes, she has certain immunities, right? And produces herself certain poisons. When you can get somebody to the level, think about the, level step up that you've just had to go to get from treating somebody modern day hitting them with one drug seeing what it does to the body um yeah and then moving on from there um take that and take it to the level of that now you've not only cured your cancer but you've given the person the ability to produce their own drugs that can be used by other people it's a, it's a completely, it's a step beyond. It's a maximization it's a, of the person. And this is what I wanted to ask. The, they're using these drugs that have to do with controlling gene expression. And I'm wondering if this is how they're controlling certain diseases. If this is how they're getting, you know, um, better responses to things that you and I would call cancer, for example. Um, hmm, I don't know. I think it's worth investigating. And that's why we have to have the virgin. If we don't bring the virgin back, if we're not bowing to that giant idol of a virgin, we're not, we, we're screwed. I think we're, I think that's it. I think we're gone. Um, uh, I don't know. What do you guys think about uh, my rambling? My first thought is just in all of the research D and I, Dion and I have been doing over the last year, we keep confronting these same kind of medicine men and women, always described in the, and not just in ancient Greece, in ancient North America and ancient China and ancient India, all over the place. 
They got the red hair. They have the scaly skin. They have the widened eyes and they're taller. And they have the snakes in their hair. And sometimes they have elongated skulls. Like there's just too much connection here with this transformation. And it's also related to these kings and to, this, to these ancient practices. Like there's definitely some kind of um, human husbandry, I think, that's ultimately happening here, you know? What, and what you is, brought this up too, sorry, just one last point is that you brought up that these women are also putting uh, medications into their culpos while they are pregnant. And they're taking these medications while they are pregnant too, right? They're bathing their children in these in these potions, right? It makes you wonder, doesn't it? What does the child... Um, what happens to that fetus as it develops? Like if you had a substance, Snappy, if I could sell you a substance, you know I wouldn't, but if I could sell you a substance that you could give to a pregnant mother that would maximize um, the child's brain capacity, would you give it to them? I, I mean, think they're already doing that today with stem cells. and Yeah, okay. Okay. You know, where do you get stem cells from? Yeah. Fetuses? <laughs> uh, I'm just saying, or, or uh, also uh, when people do circumcision. Oh, okay. <laughs> the little tips, just the tip, that goes out the back door and gets sold off for big money yeah. for your stem cells. You know, and it, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a wild thing. There's so much to unpack there too. Like, but I, what I what I what I wanted to bring up earlier was uh, speaking of human husbandry. Next week, we're gonna have a fun episode with uh, some doctors joining us. More than one doctor, multiple doctors talking about snake venoms. Yeah, we're we're really gonna go deeper into this uh, subject of human husbandry, modifying the human uh, composition using psychoactives and animals as the bio transformer. Yeah. When, when yeah. I got, when I got it, um, when I found out that they were using the venoms um, and I started working with those texts, I went out Dion and I bought a book just on um, snake venoms and the different types of venoms. There are yeah, snake venoms and envenomations by um, Chipix. And um, that, th they the, chemistry of those venoms is so complex i didn't realize it i didn't realize all the different families and the different types and the ones that are hemolytic and there are ones that are neurotoxic and all of them you know these ones that are hemolytic they, these things burn when they're going in baby these right at the, and they're not just putting a little bit they're not just partaking of a little bit this is something they're using on a daily basis and they're putting into people in ways that nobody would consider doing now right but um yeah those what are, what are we going to find Dion, about those venoms because some of the docs are saying that that shit cures uh, that stuff excuse me snappy that stuff cures uh parkinson's and stuff like that or it can stave off parkinson's what do you think well there's a reason why um snake venoms are complex they're you can't just fight it with one thing say if you're trying to come up with the antibody it targets your body in multiple ways you're talking about neurotoxin it can target the blood it, it deals with coagulation of blood at the same time targeting your your hormones your proteins so it's it's working on multiple levels so if you reverse engineer it you could come up with uh things that could keep the body young forever kill cancers because it's dealing with the main components that are in medicine we're dealing with proteins and hormones and I could, genetic I could give, sequencing and neurotoxins. This, this is what our body, you know, at the backbone of our body. That's what a snake venom targets. I could give you a venom, Dion, that would make you lactate if you had the tissue to lactate. Now, we don't know what it does in the men. I haven't been giving it to them. But Ask Jesus. <laughs> and Paul. <laughs> He wore a girdle. We talked about the girdle. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying. By, 
By the way, the eunuch stuff is coming out. I'm going to talk about it Wednesday, and I'm going to bring out Jesus the um, castrator so that we can we can all see Jesus in a very creepy scene with his children. And it's, I'm going to show it to you in a way that's going to it's going to completely ruin the whole Bible for you. You're you're never going to look at um, the, Jesus the same anymore after this. Promise. It's so gross. Yeah, and I hope you can make it. I hope you really can. I know Snappy will come. Snappy, and I'll I be there. You, I need you to tell me. I need you to tell me. Is this, is this as gross as <laughs> I'm? I, I think it is. I mean, I need your moral. What I'm saying is, <laughs> I need moral guidance, right? I don't trust Dion because you know he may think. I'll bet you, Dion, um, you may think there might be a good thing, you know, practical application of this. Well, look um, at his value. There is. He's a shepherd. Yeah. He's got to keep his sheepkins in line. I mean, <laughs> come on. Right, exactly. It gets so it gets so wild. So, like in my own, I was looking into some of the snake use or snake venom use, and we found a bunch of this more recent stuff that was happening in India. And so, and I know on one of your interviews, someone asked you about this, and this is some this is some fuel for the fire. You know, they're still regularly using snake venoms in India. It's normally associated with tribal peoples, but it's gotten a minor resurgence because what has happened is a lot of these people are taking um, opioids and then when they run out of access to opioids out of desperation they turn to the snake venoms and they go to these tribal medicine doctors and the process is is they'll tie these people to a chair then they will have the snake come and bite them directly on the tongue and then they will pass out for over an hour and some of these patients describe then being in an elevated state of some of ecstasy for upwards of seven days. You know, and that's just from one venom. You've shown several times in a lot of these potions, they got five, sometimes seven, sometimes nine venoms, you know, so. Did you see Sadhguru drinking the venom? I did. I remember you showing me that. Sadhguru is a very famous uh, modern Shaivite um, guru and yogi in India. He mostly speaks to kind of like a global audience at this point, but he's got some weirdness going on there for sure. <laughs> but it's the venom, and it's funny because in the audience, the you get hear people screaming like, ah, freaking out when he's drinking it. And he like does a little shake and starts kicking in. You know, a lot of people take the, the snake venom around the world. I remember going to the cobra temples in Benin, West Africa, and that was central to the religion, to the ancient religion, is is the snakes, snakes and cows, you know. And, and after today, I know how, how serious the cow is to human development, to protein, to milk, to leather, to to your clothing, to nature, to, to the methane, to the to the gas, to the sacred fire. The cow is essential to 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 ancient life, especially in the Bronze Age. It's like the most important of the husbanded animals. It's essential to everything. It's a sign of wealth and prestige and power, and it's it's a it's a it's a creature that provides everything necessary for life. You know, so you see this so celebrated cross culturally from Africa across the horse cultures to India to China everywhere is it loves these cows practically you know so it's very interesting but with the snake venoms and stuff i want to we're going to have so much fun with this episode next week because we're going to have uh dr matthew t who is a psychologist psychiatrist and a neurologist a specialist in in those kind of functions so he can break down really what's happening in the brain and what is happening on that level and then we're going to have Doc Daphne, who's a specialist in the genetics, and she's going to help us break down how they're utilizing these venoms in order to transition gender and in order to bring about these kind of effects that you have talked about with the various Scythians, like the height and stuff. So it's going to get wild. <laughs> I wonder if we can we ask him um, if if uh, the neurologist can we ask him what it would do if you mainline these things rectally. You know, because in order to bypass the whole stomach and de degrading of all the proteins, because um, that's what they're doing. They're doing it dermally and they're doing it rectally. I'd love to ask him, what's the difference 
right? But, um, between Fleet getting the drug on board. That's called the plea with Matt. People think you're crazy. People think we're crazy, but so you know, your favorite one of your favorite singers in the band, Fleetwood Mac. Um, at a certain point, I was developing some problems in her nasal cavity from doing too much cocaine, and so before the concert, they had to uh, find a different way to get the cocaine into her system. Unless we get the term boofing. So. <laughs> And it happens to a lot of people that, that wear out their nasal, their septum from too much cocaine use. And so these rock stars figure out that they can get it a different way and it bypasses your digestive tract and it's even stronger. So you need to take less. What if Dion, what if you took the um, person, um, what if you, cre um, in, in, instead of just applying it rectally, what if you did it in a way that it was applied by not, you know, a device, but by another person? who was um, aroused and who was under the influence of drugs that would pass through their seed um, into the other person, right? What if there, if you can, it, there's only one way to do that, right? And that's through the act of coitus, right? Um, is, that, is that different? Is that different? Is that taking the Fleetwood Mac to like the next to like sure. the next level because during the act of coitus your body produces pheromones and hormones and different chemicals to encourage the birthing process the mating process you know that's what's happening you know how about the, how about the psychedelic side what do you think about the boosting the experience of a psychedelic through sexual activity sure sure no it's all it's a drug release your body, your mind is based off the serotonin release, dopamine, you know, all these chemicals flooding your body. And that's why the, the after the orgasm, that's what people relate drugs to. Like when people tell you, it's like an orgasmic feeling, you know, it's, and so well, when you put them together, I guess it's a uh, double, you know, do it on the new moon, do it with the asteroid, do it in the sacred circle. Exactly. After you know, you can enhance it all you want. Do it with someone you love so you have oxytocin. You know, um, there's so many ways to make this special. And this is what we're talking about. This is when about you, fertility rituals in ancient times. When you you know, most of these down. episodes at the at the heart of it is fertility rituals. You know, that's the sun and the moon and life is about the human experience. And so they Those enjoyed guys. it. Yeah. And so back in the day, they enjoyed it. They enhanced it. They made it special. They worship. That's what Tantra is, you know. And so we're seeing Tantra between humans, but there was Tantra between humans and animals. You it just—it's just an inconvenient truth, but it's there. Yeah. If if you drink that mare's urine at a certain point, that stuff, you know, that that can end up inspiring you, and ultimately you're going to have this kind of hybrid relationship with the with the animal world. You're going to be entering that. You know, people wonder, how can they call the people the wolves who are guarding the temples? Well, how can they call them Medusa, right? Half virgin, half um, woman things, right? Because they're entering chemically into these worlds. They're fostering this development, right? You have to have your horns. You're not going to get your horns if you're not in the oysters. If you're not in the estrus, you don't have your horns. Right? Why do you think Isis has horns? Right? It's the mastering of that lightning. And for some reason, unless we can bring that back, we can't um, take that real trip. All the hippies taking the trips on the side with the one on ones. Oh, God, no, that goes nowhere. If you really want to blast off to where you go through that wormhole, you have to follow the right. You have to enter that initiation, and you'll know it. Right. And you can take somebody who's been on LSD. Maybe they were on LSD or mushrooms or something. Um, maybe they were trying to cure themselves of alcoholism now. Right. And they're they're in that experience. They're they're working through that experience. But that experience is not the death and rebirth that comes through that orgasmic um, right through that sexual right. You cannot reach God without going through Aphrodite. Isn't that weird? You cannot reach divinity 
without going through your own sexuality. I mean, it's like, a, I don't know, is that what the universe wants for us to, for us to have that? I, I wish I could have been there when they put those horns on Moses, because you know where those things, where you get those things from, right? You get them from being within that zone. You earn your horns by going to that place. And it's not just, it's not just, um, if I can make one contribution to the renaissance of psycho, psychotropic substances, it, it's this. Um, they've already done it. They already perfected it as an art. It's set up with, uh, as a machine with instructions. And unless you replicate that, um, you don't, you, you're not going to experience what they experienced. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but that enlightenment's not going to be real enlightenment. You're not really doing mystery. That's why you got to have that. You got to have that um, kid with the antidote. Jesus has to have him, right? It doesn't work otherwise. Um, yeah, you want to get to the seventh heaven, don't you? you gotta, wow. Well, that's you get a your like hand. and subscribe right there. A like and a subscribe and some comments and a share. You know. Exactly. And make sure you guys come back for next week when we dig deep into the snake venoms with Dr. T and Dr. Daphne and Ammon. And also go subscribe to Lady Babylon 666. Follow Ammon. He just appeared on the Forbidden Knowledge podcast. Make sure you go check it out. You will not be disappointed. It's a wild one. So thank you everyone for coming in. Any final words, Dr. Ammon? Yeah. Um, it's all there and it's way more interesting than you were told um hail satan hail satan any <laughs> final words dion oh yeah join us next week uh, and next wednesday what were you talking about a castration yes castration we're gonna have jesus with the boys and the eunuch making eunuchs we get to get together and make eunuchs next wednesday mm. and then next sunday snake venom with the doctors and then after that, we have episodes coming up about cats and dogs. It's raining cats and dogs. We're going to get into the canine and the feline. And then after that, we'll get into the birds and bees. You know, we like those bees, aviary, lapidary. And then our um, after that will be the human husbandry. Where we'll wrap up the entheogenic husbandry episode with taking all these uh symbolisms with animals and applying it to humans you know the human husbandry and so we'll take a few more episodes with the doctors to unpack this to see what we where we can go with this it's gonna be fun it's gonna get wild it's gonna be exciting tune in we have lots of amazing stuff planned for you all so thank you all for joining us peace love hail satan until next time